Hola amigos. Wish I could see you in person, but I hope you're listening to our read aloud in English and in Spanish. And I hope you're ready to read chapter two of Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. Here we go. Chapter two, Space Hotel USA. Mr. Wonka's Great Glass Elevator was not the only thing orbiting the Earth at that particular time. Two days earlier, the United States of America had successfully launched its first space hotel, a giant sausage-shaped capsule no less than 1,000 feet long. It was called Space Hotel USA, and it was the marvel of the space age. It had inside it a tennis court, a swimming pool, a gymnasium, a children's playroom, and 500 luxury bedrooms, each with a private bath. It was fully air-conditioned, it was also equipped with a gravity-making machine so that you didn't float about inside of it. You could walk normally. This extraordinary object was now speeding round and round the Earth at a height of 240 miles. Guests were to be taken up and down by a taxi service of commuter capsules blasting off from Cape Kennedy every hour on the hour, Monday through Friday. But as yet, there was nobody on board at all, not even an astronaut. And the reason for this was that no one had really believed such an enormous thing would ever get off the ground without blowing up. But the launching had been a great success, and now that the space hotel was safely in orbit, there was a tremendous hustle and bustle to send up the first guests. It was rumored that the President of the United States himself was going to be among the first to stay in the hotel, and of course there was a mad rush by all sorts of other people across the world to book rooms. Several kings and queens had cabled the White House in Washington for reservations, and a Texas millionaire called Orson Cart, who was about to marry a Hollywood starlet called Helen Highwater, was offering $100,000 a day for the honeymoon suite. <clears throat> but you cannot send guests to a hotel unless there are lots of people to look after them. And that explains why there was yet another interesting object orbiting the Earth at that moment. This was the large commuter capsule containing the entire staff for Space Hotel USA. There were managers, assistant managers, desk clerks, waitresses, bellhops, chambermaids, pastry chefs, and hall porters. The capsule they were traveling in was manned by the three famous astronauts, Shuckworth, Shanks, and Schowler, all of them handsome, clever, and brave. In exactly one hour, said Shuckworth, speaking to the passengers over the loudspeaker, we shall link up with Space Hotel USA, your happy home for the next ten years. And any moment now, if you look straight ahead, you should catch your first glimpse of this magnificent spaceship. Aha! I see something there. That must be it, folks. There's definitely something up there ahead of us. Shuckworth, Shuckworth Shanks, and Schowler, as well as the manager's assistant managers, Desk clerks, waitresses, bellhops, chambermaids, pastry chefs, hall porters, they all stared excitedly through the windows. Shuckworth fired a couple of small rockets to make the capsule go faster, and they began to catch up very quickly. Hey! yelled Schowler. That isn't our space hotel. Holy rats! cried Shanks. What in the name of Nebuchadnezzar is that? Quick, give me the telescope! yelled Shuckworth. With one hand, he focused the telescope, and with the other, he flipped the switch, connecting them to ground control. Hello, Houston, he cried into the mic. There's something crazy going on up here. There's a, there's a thing orbiting ahead of us, and it's not like any spaceship I've ever seen, that's for sure. Describe it at once, ordered ground control in Houston. It's, it's all made of glass, and it's kind of square, and it's got lots of people inside it. They're all floating about like fish in a tank. How many astronauts on board? None, said Shuckworth. They can't possibly be astronauts. What makes you say that? Because at least three of them are in night shirts. Don't be a fool, Shuckworth, snapped ground control. Pull yourself together, man. This is serious. I swear it, cried poor Shuckworth. There's three of them in night shirts. Two old women and an old man. I can see them clearly. I can even see their faces. Jeepers, they're older than Moses. They're about 90 years old. You've gone mad, Shuckworth, shouted ground control. You're fired. Give me shanks. Shanks speaking, said Shanks. Now you listen here, Houston. There's these three old birds in night shirts floating around in a crazy glass box, and there's a funny little guy with a pointed beer, wearing, beard wearing a black top hat and plum-colored velvet tailcoat and bottle green trousers. Stop! screamed Ground Control. Hold the phone, said Shanks. There's also a little boy about ten years old. Here's the astronaut. That's 
that's no boy, you idiot, shouted Ground Control. That's an astronaut in disguise. It's a midget astronaut dressed up as a little boy. Those old people are astronauts, too. They're all in disguise. But who are they, said Shanks. Well, how the heck would I know, said Ground Control. Are they heading for our space hotel? That's exactly where they're heading, cried Shanks. I can see the space hotel now, about a mile ahead. They're going to blow it up, yelled Ground Control. This is desperate. This is... Suddenly, his voice was cut off, and Shanks heard quite another different voice in his earphones. It was deep and rasping. I'll take charge of this, said the deep, rasping voice. Are you there, Shanks? Of course I'm here, said Shanks. But how dare you butt in? Keep your big nose out of this. Who are you anyway? This is the President of the United States, said the voice. And this is the Wizard of Oz, said Shanks. Who are you kidding? Cut the piffle, Shanks, snapped the president. This is a national emergency. Good grief, said Shanks, turning to Shuckworth and Showler. It really is the president. It's President Jillygrass himself. Well, hello there, Mr. President, sir. How, how are you today? How many people are there in that glass capsule? Rasped the president. Eight, said Shanks. All floating. Floating? Even outside the pull of gravity. We're outside the pull of gravity up here, Mr. President. Everything floats. We'd be floating ourselves if we weren't strapped down. Didn't you know that? Oh, of course I knew it, said the president. What else can you tell me about this glass capsule? There's a bed in it, said Shanks. A big double bed. And that's floating too. A bed, barked the president. Who ever heard of a bed in a spacecraft? I swear it's a bed, said Shanks. You must be loopy, Shanks, declared the president. You're dotty as a donut. Let me talk to Showler. Showler here, Mr. President, said Showler, taking the mic from Shanks. It is a great honor to talk to you, Mr. President, sir. Oh, shut up, said the president. Just tell me what you see. It's a bed, all right, Mr. President. I can see it through my telescope. It's got sheets and blankets and a mattress. That's not a bed, you driveling thickwit, yelled the president. Can't you understand? It's a trick. It's a bomb. It's a bomb disguised as a bed. They're going to blow up our magnificent space hotel. Who's they, Mr. President, sir, said Showler. Don't talk so much and let me think, said the president. There were a few moments of silence. Showler waited tensely. So did Shanks and Shuckworth. So did the managers and assistant managers and desk clerks and waitresses and bellhops and chambermaids and pastry chefs and hall porters. And down in the huge control room at Houston, 100 controllers sat motionless in front of their dials and monitors waiting to see what orders the president would give next to the astronauts. I've just thought of something said the president. Don't you have a television camera up there on the front of your spaceship, Showler? Sure do, Mr. President. Then switch it on, you nit, and let us all down here get a look at this object. Huh, I never thought of that, said Showler. No wonder you're the president. Here goes. He reached out and switched on the TV camera in the nose of the spacecraft. And at that moment, 500 million people all over the world who had been listening in on their radios rushed to their television sets. And on their screens, they saw exactly what Shuckworth and Shanks and Schaller were seeing. A weird glass box in splendid orbit around the Earth. And inside the box, seen not too clearly but seen nonetheless, were seven grown-ups and one small boy and a big double bed, all floating. Three of the grown-ups were bare-legged and wearing nightshirts. And far off in the distance, beyond the glass box... The TV watchers could see the enormous, glistening, silvery shape of the Space Hotel USA. But it was the sinister glass box itself that everyone was staring at and the cargo of sinister creatures inside. Eight astronauts, so tough and so strong, they didn't even bother to wear space spacesuits. Who were these people and where did they come from? And what in heaven's name was that big, evil-looking thing disguised as a double bed? The president had said it was a bomb, and he was probably right. But what were they going to do with it? All across America, and Canada, and Russia, and Japan, and India, and China, and Africa, and England, and France, and Germany, and everywhere else in the world, a kind of panic began to take hold of the television watchers. Keep well clear of them, Schaller, ordered the president over the radio link. Sure will, President, Schaller answered. I sure will. And that's the end of chapter two. Remember, if you're feeling grumpy today, hydrate. Lots of water, friends. We'll talk soon. Bye.